and less articulate that. Also, wait for the cue. Wait for the cue. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, I apologize. I am both uh, less good looking and uh, less articulate and less well timed than uh, our uh, main MC, but uh, I've been asked to uh, briefly uh, present uh, this uh, session. I will just say that looking uh, to my left at this group, I, I do uh, remember a much younger self where when I was going into my PhD training, we all saw the future, AI, machine learning, medicine, it all made sense. When I came back to medical school, and if I dared talk about what I'd done my PhD on, I felt pretty good if I just, if, if they just were, you know, mouthing nerd at me. Uh, but most of the time, completely irrelevant to what they're doing. So here we are, um, 35, 40 years later, and we have three uh, leaders of uh, top journals in, uh, in, in medicine and life sciences, and a leader in, in medicine who are just focused on that topic. And so that is a very strange dissonance, and um, I certainly don't take it for granted, and that's why I think these conversations are incredibly important. So I'll just say that if I would have, if someone had told me that we would have this panel even 20 years ago, uh, I would have been very skeptical. And so thank you everybody for doing this. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Over to you. Oh, hi. program note. Uh, my superior uh, MC told me I should say, if you have questions on uh, your live Zoom, put it in the chat. Thank you very much. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for staying to the final, uh, well, second to final inning, because of course everyone is going to stay for the poster presentation session as well. Um, but this is just such an exciting panel that we have for you today. We're gonna start off with introductions of ourselves. Um, my introduction will be quite short because as a moderator, um, I actually have an opportunity to do a longer introduction tomorrow as a panelist in a different panel. Um, but I will give plenty of time for each of our editors today to present uh, themselves and what their journals are focusing on um, when it comes to initiatives in AI and machine learning and their particular journals. And then we'll go to some panel questions. Um, so as far as myself, Maya Hightower, I've had a number of different roles within healthcare. I've been the Chief Population Health Officer as well as Chief Medical Information Officer at the University of Iowa. I was then the Chief Medical Information Officer at the University of Utah. Um, subsequently, I've stepped back from my faculty appointment. I'm still a faculty member at the University of Utah and continue on as Senior Director for Health Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, and have started um, a venture-backed startup called Equality AI, where we're creating new tools to make uh, fair and responsible AI more accessible uh, to developers and subsequently to enterprises at large. So, why don't we start with Joel? Perfect, thanks Maya. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I'm Joel Monteiro, I'm the chief editor at Nature Medicine. Um, I trained as a physician scientist. My clinical background is in psychiatry and my scientific background, completely unrelated, is in immunology. About 10 years ago, I moved on to becoming an editor. I was uh, the immunology editor uh, at Cell for about four years and a little over five years ago, I moved on to take over Nature Medicine, uh, which is a journal that publishes broadly in medicine, in the, I'd say, interface between translational medicine and clinical medicine. We are particularly interested in how things move from the bench and to computers to uh, the bedside. Yeah, in terms of machine learning, we have been very engaged with this community for the past couple of years. Uh, championing and partnering with the community in defining better ways to report. Um, uh, clinical studies involving AI, we've worked uh, very actively with the community on extensions on reporting tools that already exist like Consort and Spirit, 
develop guidance for studies that involved machine learning, worked with several people in this room also in guidelines for transparent reporting of algorithm, medical algorithms in the context of uh, translational and clinical research. Some of you have participated in the MyClaim checklist, which now we have been, we have been using for about two years, uh, encouraging our, our <coughs> authors to report their studies uh, using those principles. And we continue to be very interested. It's been a wonderful day of uh, hearing from you. Where do you think the gaps are that still need to be filled with additional research? I think this field has been blossoming, and there is a lot more to come in our pages. And I'm sure, uh, with our colleagues as well. Um, thanks, uh, Joao and Maya. I, I'm Eric Rubin. I'm from the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I am also a. Uh, I'm a an infectious disease clinician, but uh, largely a basic scientist, uh, a bacterial geneticist. Somehow the search committee at New England Journal threw it up royally because we're really a, a um, clinical trials journal and I have never done a clinical trial in my life. Um, AI though is different because I have used Google search, so I feel pretty confident. <laughs> um, and um, the journal's more than 200 years old and um, it, it uh, sometimes feels its age. Uh, and, and, and we don't want to be a relic. We want to be where the action is. And, and part of where the action is is certainly AI. Um, and so, like Joao um, said, we, in the last few years, uh, last four or five years, have been thinking hard about um, where, how to position ourselves. What are the kinds of things that are really moving medicine? Um, and that's what we're looking for. We're not looking for in, in our journal, we're not looking for a, um, a, a better algorithm, a better mousetrap, but what's going to have an effect on a patient tomorrow? Um, and, and we have had a, a good deal of help from Zach. I don't think he was a member of our, a very active member of our editorial board. Um, and uh, we've gotten to publish uh, some things. Remember, we don't publish that much. We publish 200 research articles a year, uh, but we have published some AI. We have more upcoming. Um, and it's a, it's a place where I think the action is, and I think we really want to be. Hi, everyone. Am I eating the microphone enough? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so my name is Rupa Saka. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Lancet Digital Health, which is a relatively new journal uh, launched by the Lancet, which is going to be 200 years old next year. Not that we're competing, Eric. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, the Lancet Digital Health itself was founded by myself um, three years ago, and we really launched at a time when um, there were some fantastic papers coming out. Research in AI was accelerating, um, it was getting very exciting. I think Nature Medicine had published some fantastic research that was getting more robust, um, and we launched with a mission, really, and it, that had three goals. Um, the mission was really to make a positive impact and change in medicine, um, and our three goals were, one, to um, make sure we showcase validated technology that meets a clinical need um, in um, a real world environment. And so this meant that we have, like Jao mentioned, um, we have been partaking in establishing standards in the field, whether that's a record um, for big data studies or STARD for diagnostic studies in AI, and tripod for predictive studies, as well as consort, of course, for clinical um, AI studies. And we're really looking to help establish you know, some element of future proofing in AI studies. We sort of talked about it a little bit today, um, hearing from some amazing speakers about um, testing iterations of AI that is, um, that is deployed in hospitals. So we want to really be help, help researchers um, work towards this goal. And second, um, we want to make sure that healthcare meets um, the needs of those who need it most, um, you know, whether that's underserved or marginalized communities. Um, and we want to do that by helping to bridge between communities in the same way that um, Zach wants to do that here in this conference. And thirdly, we want to help um, address the bias problem in AI and um, to do that we're, we're working on increasing diversity um, with the community that we work with, whether that's our um, international advisory board members or our peer reviewers or our authors. Um, so we're, we're really excited about these goals and this mission and we're excited to be here to speak with you all. Thank you.
Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all three. And so the first question, this is the burning question that each of you have on your minds. What does it take to get published? <laughs> <laughs> that is the question. So if you are an ML or an AI or other computational uh, driven researcher, how do you get published in your journal? Okay. I'll go first. Um, that, that one is very easy. Uh, all you have to do is to submit your paper in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> we generally do not submit, publish papers that have not been <laughs> submitted to us. I think that's the first criteria. Um, after that, I think, you know, I think actually this question is very easy to answer today because we've touched pretty much upon everything that we editorially look for in our papers in the discussions that have happened today. So we are looking for papers that are grounded on a question that's not detached what's happening in the clinical uh, scenario where that problem is relevant, um, that has a very clear question, um, that is innovative in its approach, that it's a robust approach. Uh, we've been, as much as the community has developed and has been progressing, uh, looking forward to having more perspective validated algorithms in our papers. Uh, we certainly uh, are thinking more about how we assess the unintended consequences of application of that algorithm it, it moves into the real world. So all the points that you know we, we discussed it here in the, the past panels, are those are the criteria that we are uh, looking for uh, to you know, check in the papers that we think are very strong candidates for us. And none of, I think, you know, as a, any field that's still in development, and I think this field is blossoming, but it's still in fairly early days, uh, we understand that not in every single paper check all those boxes, but those are the things that we are, you know, we are thinking actively when we look for papers. So I'm in room 219. If you write your name on the back of a $100 bill. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, I was going to say a 1000 <laughs> <laughs> That was very cheap, Patrick. <laughs> um, so I, I think what it goes back to what I was saying initially about our, uh, our focus, which is making a difference in the lives of clinicians, but the patients they care for, uh, ultimately. Um, and is our, that's our yardstick for, for judging papers. Now, it's relatively easy to judge the things that we see all the time. It's much more difficult to judge something new. And I think the AI that we've seen falls into a uh, a few varieties, um, a better mousetrap variety, which is um, we've got an algorithm that's better than the algorithm that people are using, generally is not going to be right for us because it doesn't fundamentally change things. Then there's the um, either making a doctor perform better, the assistive sorts of things that we heard about this morning uh, and earlier today, or, the, uh, or replacing a doctor. Um, um, altogether. Um, you no longer need a radiologist or an ophthalmologist because you've got this um, AI gadget. Um, and that is more interesting, particularly if it's applied in a situation where you don't have an ophthalmologist or a radiologist. Not just let's make it cheaper, but let's make it um, better. Um, using it, um, I was speaking earlier with Jim, who's with, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, Michael, who's using his gadget in Bangladesh, where they don't have access to ophthalmologists. And that's, that's quite interesting. And the third thing, of course, is a truly transformative thing, where the AI does something that you could never have guessed without by doing it uh, yourself. And, and, that, and, and to the extent that that can influence patient care, that's the thing, of course, that we'd love to see, where the AI finds something that a human doesn't see in, that, in, in, in those data or in those images. So, now, all of that, of course, is in the background of rigor. Um, and if you're going to apply something to a patient, you have to make sure that it really works. And um, there are sort of traditional standards of rigor. I think that we do have to rethink them to some extent uh, when it comes to AI, uh, but only to some extent. We still want to know that this is re something real um, and something that, if you used it tomorrow, wouldn't be dangerous. Um, so, so. I think all of those go into the decision making. Yeah, I think what I'll say will echo what Zhao and Eric have just said, and also what the speakers said today. Um, and I've made some notes on the things that we look for, because 
because I got this question in advance. Um, and they're timestamp notes because they're almost identical to many of the, the things that um, we, we just heard. So there are really three key points for us at the Lancet Digital Health. So it's robustness, it's clinical use, and it's ethical studies. These are the studies that we're looking for. So by robustness, we mean we want to see studies that have um, validation that's appropriate, that uses um, protocols that are prospectively registered, that share data. Um, that's a key thing that we, we are looking for more and more, um, that our reviewers are looking for more and more. In terms of clinical use, um, like Eric said, we're looking for studies that impact the patients, that use patients in their development as well, and have patients in mind um, at the central and core to the, to the ethos of the research. And then finally, in, we're looking for ethical studies, studies that have considered um, data sharing, pri pri data security, and patient privacy. Um, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And as you guys really have, have emphasized, you know, robustness, rigor, um, ethics, clinical use, what are these specific experiments that you're looking for? Are you asking us for a specific study that we'd like to see? Sure, yeah, dream study. That's actually a better question. Because <laughs> <laughs> maybe they will design your dream study if you tell oh, okay. them. Okay, <laughs> so, so, so uh, let me make one up and I'll give everyone, okay, I'll start and give everyone else a chance to, uh, to fantasize. Um, maybe fantasy isn't the right word for it, no. but... Um, <laughs> Um, uh, let's go to the discussion that we just had on, on equity. Um, here's a problem that uh, um, being equitable um, treatment, equitable um, engagement and care of patients is a real huge problem. Is there a way to f fix that? Because I can't think of good ways that are, are easy ways that are systematic. Uh, people ha are trying some of those. But could it, there be an AI that suddenly meant that there was equitable access to care for groups that ordinarily wouldn't get? That would be something that would be just cool. Would we be able to publish it? I don't know. I mean, it would depend on, it's, it's an experiment like any other experiment. It would need to have all the elements of rigor that we would expect of any, sort, any other sort of study. But here's something where we have an application that is a little out of the box and something that could really make a difference for a patient tomorrow. So I'd love to see something like that. I think to add to that, to make a real impact on patients tomorrow, we need to be using gold standards and comparing them rather than sort of AI studies that we're seeing at the moment where they might compare them to five radiologists or, um, or, a, or a measure that isn't actually used in clinical practice. We're looking for, for real standards and metrics that are clinically useful. Um, we're also making, wanting to see it being tested in the clinic um, and, you know, in order to also see that the, the, the AI tool that we're looking at could be used elsewhere, we want to see it, an open code data set that can be reproduced and tested in other places. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that's really what we're looking for in terms of experiments, I think. Yeah, I mean, I tend to think about this question in different ways. I think it really depends on what the, the paper is, what is the, the purpose of the paper. If you're developing a completely new algorithm or if you're trying to address a problem uh, with a new algorithm, as you know, Ziad just showed to us, uh, which happened to have been published in my journal, so I feel <laughs> very confident that we would have wanted it. <laughs> uh, I think you know. Then the focus is on the innovation and the robustness of the approach. I think if you are taking something that already exists and you really want to take the next step towards implementing it, or showing that that has you know meets a specific health outcome for patients, then we go back to a different standards. We are looking for different things in a paper. Uh, so I think it really, really depends on what the question is and where you are in that that you know, spectrum. Uh, when you're transitioning from the translational space to early clinical to later clinical. Yeah, and, and Eric, you kind of hinted at the kind of innovations that you'd like to see. 
Um, how about others on the panel? What innovations other than health equity? I think everyone's excited about health equity. I mean, that's like a given, right? Um, but what other innovations are you get you really excited? Yeah, I think, um, so I'm really excited by things that impact health policy. So obviously COVID is still ongoing, but um, we published a paper by Cecile Verbood, um, who works for the NIH, and they used, um, they use crowdsourced data to monitor the epidemic, the COVID epidemic, very early on in March 2020. And then this paper went on to inform UK government policy on, on uh, monitoring the disease. So just to see the research being used in that way was very exciting. Um, we also had a systematic review on contact tracing that came out in a timely moment um, when we realized that contact tracing didn't work. So. Um, that was a very exciting innovation that we were seeing at that time. I think I mentioned underserved and marginalized populations, and one of the innovations that I think Matt talked about today was drug repurposing, and um, obviously that we can see the impact of that through his talk, but we also saw it during the COVID pandemic when, we, when it was used to discover bar, barcitinib. So, um, you know, I think things like that that really um, impact the field immediately uh, is, is very um, innovative and exciting. And then finally, something that we look for is uh, our papers that establish new standards. So, for example, digital therapeutics in mental health. Um, we recently published a paper um, that showed a video game could be used to treat ADHD. And this um, has now been FDA approved for further studies and it's really the first of its kind. So we're, we're looking for papers that sort of set a standard that um, inspire other, for other research that, that comes um, next. So. <coughs> yeah, Eric? Um, so I... I um, I, I have to agree, you know, complete with, with Rupa, we're looking for things that set a standard uh, that have, and, and we're a very late stage journal, we're publishing mostly applications um, and, and implementation of something. So um, it has to meet all of those bigger standards. Um, for example, we published a study from Apple and, um, uh, and, and Stanford looking at uh, the the Apple Watch, um, example right here, I'm not, it's not an ad actually, though, um, that, uh, 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 that used it to diagnose um, uh, arrhythmias in, in ambulatory patients. Um, very, very cool study. And, uh, you know, the, 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 an example of what you might be able to do, we've heard a, a lot about the EHR and its limitations um, that are bypassed to, to some extent by collecting data primarily from, from a device. And, and, and I think things like that, innovations like that, are super interesting to us. Rupa also mentioned mental health. This is an area that has, I think, lagged in general in terms of rigorous uh, clinical studies. We would love to see more in the area of mental health. Question, whether it's AI or anything else for them. Yeah, I mean, I can uh, agree, pretty much agree with Eric and Rupa. Maybe I'll take a, a different route here. I would be very excited to see more studies where the data is shared in some, at some extent. I think this has been a major problem in this field, and I think there has been a high level of tolerance uh, in the community to seeing studies published with pretty much zero data availability or code availability, and I think everyone now has reached it to the point. Uh, to a point that you know this should also be taken into account, and it's something that we are starting rethinking our approach to it, uh, and becoming a bit more strict and uh, with vultures as regards to you know, how much leeway they have to not share it, data in the way that publish. Because I think if you if you want to be, I mean, no one has to publish papers with us, but I think if you want to be part of this community and be recognized by your peers, I think you know you have to make provisions uh, in an ethical way to, to be able to share your data in some form. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. And that sort of leads into our next question about, about um, standards around bias detection. Um, we, it was mentioned earlier today about the variation in bias detection, bias reduction, um, uh, fair modeling. So what do you look for in establishing that an AI or a computational paper 
has addressed the risk of bias um, or unfairness. I may have to start. I think that's uh, an ongoing discussion, as we've seen here. I think this is a fairly uh, new area or new way of thinking uh, about AI. Uh, we certainly will start with you know having a well-described training and validation data sets. I think this is the bare minimum that we want to to be available to our referees so that they can also assess um, you know uh, what what conditions your algorithm has been developed and how it has been trained and validated and what are the limitations that it might have. Um, and then we will definitely engage ethicists and, you know, uh, I'd say other expertise uh, in the assessment of our paper so they can advise us on um, where you know, that algorithm could be introducing harm. I, I mean, I think we, we would consider AI as we consider any study, which is uh, right now we don't demand that our studies be representative at this point. We demand they be transparent, though, and that they discuss the bias, the potential biases, and why they got the people they got. So, if you were to do a study in Japan, then all your all your uh, research subjects would be Japanese, and um, there's an an evident reason for that. Uh, but if you do it in the US and you have 2% of your population is black um, and 98% is white, then there's something wrong with that study. Um, because large clinical studies are established years ago, um, we don't at this point demand that they not have such, those biases in their populations, but we will demand it at some point. And right now we're demanding that people say that. AI is different because, um, in, in, in many ways, because much of it is, is based on retrospectively collected data. Um, and there are issues with that. Um, many databases uh, do not contain either representations of race and ethnicity, or they don't contain very useful representations of race and ethnicity. Um, and and that's, that's a problem. But at the very least, people should come clean about that. And, and say that's a problem. That, that's a problem. Getting to what Joao said about ultimately testing whether or not there's bias, I think that is a, a challenge that is going to continue to be uh, determined for us. Um, I don't think that some of the uh, biased algorithms that the clinical algorithms that used were obviously clinically were obviously biased at the time, but it became clear as you saw them being uh, being used. I think we need better methodology for it. And Yeah, I think we know and we've discussed that the data is messy, it's not perfect. Um, and as Eric said, it's really important to acknowledge the limitations of the data, um, acknowledge exactly what the demographics are. If you can, we've already discussed how much we'd appreciate open data um, in order to be able to see um, what the data is composed of, what potential biases there are. Um, we, also, we also like to see stratified analysis to sort of estimate what the impact of, of there being a, a lower percentage of a certain gender, for example. Um, obviously, validation in a different cohort would also help with understanding bias. Um, and, and as Jao said, we, we like to make sure that we get our papers reviewed by a diverse set of people who can try and, um, try and troubleshoot any potential biases that might occur. We're also encouraging, um, we have a call for papers for studies on um, underserved and marginalized populations, so we encourage um, papers that show any kinds of biases in tools that exist or, or you know, that or we, where we can compare studies of that kind. And I guess a not slightly different take on this question, um, which was inspired by a conversation I was having with um, Michael uh, today, there's a lot of bias in terms of researchers who study in AI, um, especially as now AI um, represents quite a lot of money, I would say. And so we're having a lot of discussions at The Lancet about conflicts um, of interest in AI researchers, especially in a journal like mine where we only publish content from um, AI researchers. And so the conflicts that, and the biases of, of these researchers really need to be explicit. So we want to know exactly what, what contributions um, people are making to various 
uh, companies that they, they might advise and so on. So this is also really important in terms of transparency. Oh, wonderful insight. And so now we're, we're, we have plenty of time to address your questions. So what questions do you have for this panel of you know, publishers? And definitely we'd want to use the mic so that it is uh, available for those that are on Zoom. This is your one and only chance. Like, oh, whoa, <laughs> all of a sudden there's like multiple hands. <laughs> Pick the brains of the editors. Okay, so. All right, so I'm not as old as Zach, but uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm not saying anything bad, it's just I'm not. Um, but it was just six years ago that many of the people in this room were considered research parasites. So it's an interesting, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to turn this into a positive, just, just bear with me. So, so I think it's interesting and it's amazing at the turnaround and the way that different journal articles are viewing data scientists these days. So I was, I was actually saying that as a compliment, uh, sort of. <laughs> yeah, after, after I beat you down, I build you back up. So, so one of the common themes that, I, that I, I've been hearing also is, is data sharing. And uh, this is a difficult question because uh, as, as data scientists and depending on what field you are, it's usually a lot of data. And it's not going to fit on a supplemental drive uh, that you're using. If, if I'm doing a study with 10,000 whole slide images, uh, that's going to be a significant cost if I wanted to make that available. So what sort of advice can you give us to uh, provide opportunities for data sharing that won't break the bank? So, so I, I'd like to start with that one since I'm, I'm from the Data Parasite Journal. Um, <laughs> that before my time, um, I should I, say. I just want to point out, that was said at our competing conference on the Pacific Coast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm a basic scientist, and the standard in, in basic science has long been that primary data are, what are freely available. You can't publish without it. It's simple. Um, and when that, was, uh, when that started, when uh, particularly DNA sequence, which was the first set of data that were sort of codified and, and put into databases, came about, there was a lot of resistance in the community um, who were generating those data. Now it's, 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 it's automatic, um, it's really not a problem. It, it took, took a while though for people in the field to adapt to it. That's the world that I come from and I um, understand that there are um, limitations. The limitations that you talked about, which is very expensive to archive data. Um, in the basic science world, a lot of that has been done through by funders, um, the NIH, um, EMBL, Places like that have um, created warehouses uh, for information. Um, it's, it's admittedly harder with more complexity data. Um, and, and in fact, in the basic science world, that would be metabolomics data, which are very large multidimensional data sets. Um, um, and, and then images as well, as you're suggesting with, uh, with, with slides. There's no perfect answer. I think. And then, of course, there are the huge issues around privacy and consent um, that, that are not simple. So I don't think there's a simple answer, except to say that the, the move should be to making these data available. That it should be, and exactly as Joao said, that should be the standard for publishing. People should be able to access data and, 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 and do with it what they can. Um, I, I think there was once a concern that people would um, the data parasite idea came from the, that people would constantly be harassing authors over they got it, you got it wrong because I reanalyzed your data and it came out different differently. In fact, that's not what most people want to do. What most people want to do is create something new um, using the same data, and I think we, that should be encouraged, not discouraged. Yeah, to add to that, I think in Europe, like it's very much the funders. Well, in the NIH as well, and Bill and Melinda Gates, these funders have repositories that they're trying to develop for researchers for their data. Um, and the reason they're doing it is for 
promoting secondary use of, of the data and to understand how to reuse the data whilst um, maintaining patient privacy. So I think what we do is we try and promote all the um, da um, data repositories that we know of, obviously, as Eric said, a lot of them are basic science ones. So my background is actually in genomics, and in genomics, they've really um, led on sort of repositories that, that exist. Um, but if there is anything that we can do to help, I would really love to hear it. Absolutely, I don't have much else to add to say. I think this will be, you know, a problem that's not going to have just one solution, and it just requires community engagement, as it has happened, you know, in the genetics community in the past. Uh, but you know, there needs to be this resolution from you guys that this is important. Yeah, and and uh, and, and, and from the people generating. I, I mean, I understand that the audience here is uh, using data sets that, um, in many cases, other people have generated. Certainly, the data generators have to be in on that conversation. Yeah. Uh, but the other people who have to be in that conversation are funders, and they uh, they really should be create. We should be helping uh, them create mandates. Um, Thanks so much. Really interesting presentation. Thank you for all of your thoughts. Um, my question is is a little bit specific, and that's a little bit of a pun as to what I'm going to ask. So I'm a surgeon, and I, I work with a lot of subspecialists. And one of the things that we uh, hear in is that some of the things that we write about are very niche. And so when we send these papers in for to some of the major journals, we hear that these are great papers, but that they should be pushed to some of the subspecialty journals because they they have they have a better place in one of these subspecialty journals. And as as one of these people that writes these papers, that makes one think that sometimes the the specialties the subspecialties have a lower value in terms of the kinds of questions that they're asking or the ways that they're asking those questions. And I was just wondering. How do, we, how do we kind of work with that dynamic where the things that are being generated by subspecialists are sometimes being pushed to some of these niche journals as opposed to being published at some of the major ones? I mean, I, I sort of turned this question around a little bit. I, I tend to think about papers uh, from the perspective of what I think the readership of this paper is and who you are trying to reach and whether the journal, my journal in particular, is the best venue to highlight and to you know uh, showcase your research. And sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Uh, so I think you know there's speaking from for myself now. I think there's a space for all specialties and all kinds of work in our journal. We are nonetheless limited and uh, uh, you know have many more papers than, than we would like to publish. And sometimes sometimes have to think about what's beyond the science and who, who we are trying to reach by publishing that research. Yeah, I, I, first off, I, I don't think that publishing in a, um, in a subspecialty journal is a, is a big knock. I, I mean, I'm a subspecialist and I have to read ID journals, otherwise I couldn't take care of patients. Um, and I think a lot of it is a matter of what the competition for space is. Now, the, because we're a print journal, we can only, we only have a limited number of slots, uh, and we have a limited number of editors to, because the editing is pretty crazy. They change every line, um, every sentence, pretty much, um, of, of, of things that get submitted usually. Um, so given that limited resource, we're, like Joao, we're trying to say, all right, is this the right place for this? Is it one of the top 200 papers of the year? But that's not a simple calculus. It's not just a matter of the number of people affected. We publish things that are about one patient sometimes with an obscure genetic disease because the, the science that re, it's revealed by that, by that patient or the fact that you can create a drug that's an, for an, an N of one drug might be very, very interesting. So uh, there's no simple answer. We publish surgery papers. We don't publish that many, but we do publish surgery papers. Um, but we can't publish too much of anything except oncology, which has seen worse. I think we have a question from the audience. Yeah, so the, 
I actually have a couple questions, but I'm going to roll two of them into one because I think they kind of tag team off another really nicely. So the first is from, I'll, I'll read them first and then I'll give you my moderator sort of synthesis. Um, the first is from Kate Fultz Hollis and she says, um, she wanted to be very clear that this is not supposed to be mean or poking fun at anyone, but um, she's looking well, for... You can take this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but she's looking for some guidance about your thoughts on um, for publishing and for disseminating research, especially in innovative AI technologies and policy papers, people who want to do this in an open source format in your journals, what should they be thinking about? And I'm sure that you know there's, there's a different policy from each of the journals you come from, but to hear a little bit would be great. And then, like I said, sort of tag teaming off from that, uh, Juan Sebastian Osorio asks, um, are you encouraging participation from re researchers from the global south? Uh, because we should be improving the evidence from other parts of the world. So I think that mm. sort of the theme that's coming from both of these questions is the idea of equity in access to science. And I, I'd just like to hear if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah. I'm from there, apparently, right? So I feel <laughs> obliged to answer this question, being from the Global South, the old, and, you know, and in Europa as well. Um, so the, the, the uh, I say short question, yes, we would like to see more papers coming from other places that are not the United States or, you know, continent of Europe or the UK uh, or China. Um, the, certainly, the, I would say that the majority of the papers we receive come from those places and that is reflected in the output of what we publish, but it's not that there is a lack of interest uh, for sure. Um, and the, the first question is? Sorry. Open source, yes. Um, are you, I'm not sure if it's referred specifically on so I think access it's to the research we publish and open access. More to the open access to the research because we talked a little bit earlier about yeah, yeah open open source data being published yes. and code, but there's also the idea of accessing the articles. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Certainly, you know, I think all of our journals are in some way in the transition to become open access journals. I think this is a the, the way of traveling and there's no way of going back. We do offer um, an open access option to authors that are funded and are required to publish open access. So, and then now most, most recently have introduced an option that the authors, even if they don't have, they, they're not a, uh, under a mandate, they can choose to, do, to publish open access should they choose. Uh, but I would say this is a, this is a process that we're going through. As options are certainly uh, out there. So the Lancet Digital Health is open access. Um, and we, we have waivers for um, authors who don't have the funding. As Jan mentioned, most of the funding comes from the US, the UK, Germany, these high income countries, which is why we're seeing a lot of papers that are outputted from there. But we are very interested in research from the Global South done by researchers in the Global South. So we actually have a policy where we don't consider research papers about the Global South by authors from high income countries. So that's important to know. And um, with regards to open source, you know, in addition to being open access, we also ensure that all, any, any kind of open source data is um, linked to very clearly in our pages. Yeah, this is a slightly harder for one for me because we aren't open access and we don't have an open access uh, policy. Uh, we do give lots of points to people who submit papers from uh, low and middle income countries and we, uh, we publish a disproportionate number of the ones that are submitted, I'd say. Um, I, we think that it's a very interesting. Um, they tend to be infectious disease, so therefore they're good. Um, <laughs> um, as far as open access goes, I, I think that uh, Joao is right. Inevitably, that's probably where we're going. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work for us in our model. Um, we're a, and I should say that I publish most of what I publish is in open access, from my own lab is in open access uh, journals. But, but I think it's worth, it, it, we're, we're a little different. We're a clinical journal and a, when we publish something, we are well aware that someone is going to act on that tomorrow. The other thing is we're a journal written by researchers who are submitting, but read by clinicians who can't, do, don't have the sophistication I mean, if I can say that in this room, um, to, uh, to uh, critically read the way that you would read an AI paper. Um, and therefore, we edit extremely heavily. It's very expensive. 
what it means for an author is there um, is we have no fees. It's always free for the authors. So there's no question about someone from uh, Africa submitting. There's no there's no barrier because uh, it's, it's free. Um, it's free to free to submit. It's free to publish. Um, uh, but it's very expensive. We have ten full time nine MDs and one PhD editor. We have 10-ish full-time, I mean, it's part-time um, MD editors um, and change everything. So we're wrestling with how we can do the quality that we do with, with the money from, from open access. It doesn't work for us right now, but um, I, I, I'm, it, we also make everything free after six months to everybody. And it's free in seven, uh, everything we publish is free in the 70 lowest income countries. One thing I wanted to add, though, was that we're preaching to the, the, some of the most well-known scientists in the world here, and I think it's your job to take what we've said and, and reproduce it in order to get, gain access for others, um, where there are only a few editors. So I have done talks and things in, in the Global South, but I can't get everywhere, so please do reproduce what we've said. Thank you very much. Hi there, Rahul Dadapkar. Thank you all for your fantastic insights um, into you know, how we should be thinking about what we put stuff together. Um, I, I was wondering if you might be able to give us a little bit of insight um, into your thoughts on how best to communicate um, our findings in the AI fields. Um, and you know, especially, I think the earlier in the process you begin to start thinking about that, the, the more integrated it can become into the data gathering and development process. So just any you know, thoughts about frameworks you use or in your experience having read thousands or you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of papers, um, you know, what's, what's the advice you can give all of us? So, so I, I love the idea of patients being involved in research um, because uh, part of what it allows you to do is to talk to an audience that um, doesn't understand necessarily the mechanics of what you're doing. Um, for our journal, and, and again, it's, it's a, I think each of our journals have different audiences. For our journal, our audience is people who won't have any insight into AI. If you can explain it to a patient, you can explain it to a doctor. Um, in fact, probably the level won't be that much different. Um, um, and, and, and I think that's, um, that's really important. When it comes to submitting a paper and getting it by editors, um, they're going to take a careful look at it, but they're largely not at a, at a general journal, the first person to see it is not likely to be an AI uh, specialist, not, un, unlike Rupa's journal. You submit to us, you're not the first person who, who sees it or reviews it isn't likely to be an AI person. So it is important to frame the work in a way that's accessible. Um, and now, I'm, I'm, there are different audiences for different parts of your work. The algorithm development, um, um, a doctor doesn't have to read that. Um, but your peers do, and it has to be presented with the sophistication of, 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 of your peers. Uh, but for our journal, it would have to be presented in a way that is at least where people understand why you're doing what you're doing. I would say the same. I think you, sh you need to think about your audience. And you know, the broadest is the scope of the journal you're trying to submit to. The least likely will be that the majority of our readers will be in your field. So you know, as you begin to prepare a paper, it's, I think it's a, always a good exercise to get people who are, you know, um, scientists but working outside of your expertise to look at the, the paper and give you some feedback as regards whether they can understand the points you're trying to make. With it. Yeah, I'm trying to think of something original and unique to add to that. Um, so the question was how to communicate your AI research and how to think of it from the very beginning. So I mentioned a whole bunch of guidelines very quickly, um, but we have them on our website. And these guidelines um, will take you through what the kinds of things that we're looking at when we consider an AI paper. So Consort AI, for example, published in both mine and Zhao's journal, um, explain what um, what experimentation we're looking for in cl in clinical trials that use AI and why. So there, there's you know how, why we why we need that level of detail and how to communicate that to our audience and um, being clinicians and AI experts. So um, that is helpful. And yeah, I think I think really think about 
what the what the purpose is at the end of the day. Be be able to do that thing that marketers do, where you can where you can pitch things in one sentence. I think that's really um, that's really important as well, um, in order to really refine your your thinking and and your concept around what you're developing. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that no, no, we were good. also we didn't not publish Consort AI, but we were involved in yes. setting up the guidelines. Um, we, we don't strictly follow um, guidelines necessarily, but we, we are big believers in in, in, um, in helping you understand the kinds of things that people want. Got another question over here. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the insightful discussion. And my question is uh, based on um, observations on how to ensure the reliability of publication. So it may be not just about the current standard of publication, but about what we can do together to ensure the reliability and robustness. As we know for drug trials, it might be sufficient for ensuring that that particular drug will be sufficient for like, helping patient because like randomized control trial would eliminate the effect of confounding. And my question is, for AI models, uh, they have many, more, many other different objectives, for example, fairness, transparency, and many others. And a simple randomized trials may not be able to ensure all of these objectives. And what would be like, the, the concepts or the additional works that we can do together to make sure that our models can also ensure and achieve all those different objectives at the same time? Thank wow, you. I think we can spend the next week here discussing that. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have a simple answer to that question. I think that's an ongoing discussion that, I guess if I would say something, it's, it's to be able to involve experts across a very broad range uh, of expertise. And we've had some of these expertise represented here throughout the panel in the day. Uh, but you know, I think I think this is an ongoing discussion, and, I don't, and I'm, I'm afraid I don't have an easy answer to that question. I think that's an amazing question, and I think it might be it might have been because we've set the bar quite high in yeah. our in our discussion. We want X, Y, Z, and all of them at once. But really, a research paper isn't isn't the end of the end of the answer. You know, it's a part of a puzzle, and we know that one research paper isn't going to be able to answer every question, at least not the papers in the Lancet Digital Health, and, and we know that there will be another conversation and there'll be, there will, there, it will continue. And so um, I think we want the, the answer to the question in that one paper to be as robust as possible and any limitations to be highlighted and, and any future work to be signposted as clearly as possible. Randomized control trials are a really dumb idea. There's no way around it. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you set up this huge trial that can involve thousands of people. It can cost $100 million to do the trial, and you only get to ask one question. Um, and even if, in the middle of the five years that you're doing the trial, you realize that it's actually no longer an important question, you still have to answer it. Um, it's, <laughs> it's terrible, it, it, yet it's the best thing we have for rigor. In, in basic science, we would never use a statistical, a single statistical test to decide if something is true or not. We would use lots of different pieces of evidence that are, are orthogonal to each other to say this is likely to be true. Uh, but in, in the clinic, it's much more difficult to do that. I, I am struck by the fact that with AI, you can t conceivably test things in different ways. And that may be the answer. But like Joao says, it's a very moving target and I think we all would like to see even non-AI clinical studies be better methodologically than they are. Um, and I think people are working on, on different ways and we are very, I think we're all very open to something that's better. Yeah, I would say to add to, adding to that, you know, I don't think we should think about RCTs, you know, traditional RCTs for, uh, for drug interventions as necessarily the way to go with AI. I think maybe there are other better ways, more complex ways uh, to think about it, you know. So yes, it's not because we've been using this as a gold standard for a certain type of interventions for the past uh, number of years that this will be the solution. Yeah, I can I get to one thing that, that Michael brought up uh, this morning, which is the FDA requires that an algorithm be fixed. Um, I, I think that is kind of important for us as well. Um, we can't just have a continuously moving target um, for the algorithm uh, because it's just impossible to figure out what's going on. 
Um, so th that's one area where, just like a randomized controlled trial, which sets a, an, a, uh, um, a plan and has to stick with it, AI really has to do that same thing to be rigorously testing whether or not it's working. You can't just make changes halfway through. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to go back to the, the YouTube audience for this last one. And um, so the, 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 um, the, the question asker mentions this concept by the Nobel Award winning ec economist uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who gave this principle that data, unlike other types of products, you know, I guess in this case research products, um, is inherently anti-rival, which means that it's something that when you get it out there, it's actually of greater value to more people, whereas with other types of science, you publish it, and other people can't do it then. Um, and so the, the, they're asking, um, do you agree with that principle? And then moreover, as a result, do you think that your role as a publisher changes when you're publishing papers that are providing data to the common public, uh, essentially enabling more people to do more science that way? I'm not sure if I entirely agree. I think data is a product of any papers in any area. I think, they, I think we're talking about different scales when it, when it comes to machine learning. Yeah, so maybe, maybe large data sets that come out of an AI study, Certainly for the example. The value of the data is perhaps disproportional as compared to the value of the data in other types of research, but I think data is always <laughs> of value and it's always what's going to be built upon. Uh, after anything gets published. Yeah, and, and every paper has data. Um, most of it traditionally has massage data rather than the, uh, the, the primary data, the raw data that, um, that it's based on. Um, and, and the definition of raw is, is, up, is in the eye of the beholder as well. How massage does it get, is it before it gets into that database? Um, but that being said, I, I think we all feel that the value of raw data, the large data sets themselves, it is real and I think we'd all love to see it more accessible. I don't know if I agree with the, f I understand that large data sets are, are valuable but you still need skills and tools to, to process them and to evaluate them and um, in the same way that you would with the other data that, that um, Eric and Jao mentioned. Um, so no, I don't think our role changes. I think it's, it is very equal. You know, this is why research papers have multiplied over I'll, time. I'll point out that I did not win the Nobel Prize though, so take it <laughs> with a grain of salt. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, so did you say that we have time for one last, last question? Okay, this is it. You get to bring it home. Uh, all right, well, uh, it's, it's a, a question going back to data. Uh, uh, Nigam Shah uh, from Stanford University. Uh, what are your thoughts on so many proprietary, sorry, or rather data businesses coming around like Truveta and Health Verity and DataVant, uh, and there's like eight or nine of them, or maybe more. Uh, as researchers, most of those businesses are willing to give us data access to do things, but then if we build something and bring it to a journal, there's no way they will let us publish the data. And so how do we resolve this sort of weird economy being created where increasingly our own institutions are putting data out into this commercial garden, which we're free to use, but we can't release. And then how would that fare at a journal? You know what, this goes back to the question of how to make data available, and I think we talked about all the players that are important in, in getting that data out there, like the funders, uh, uh, the researchers, et cetera. Um, what we didn't mention in that was regulators, um, and, and I, I, you know, it doesn't make any sense that data that for which regulatory decisions are based on isn't publicly available. Um, and so I, I think that is the, the pressure point, uh, honestly, for, for data. If the FDA required all the data to be available, then it would be available because otherwise you don't get to sell your product. So I, I would love to see that and it just seems right, doesn't it, that the decision should be, trans that's how you make decision transparent. So that's where I'd love to see it. I, I think that we are all fans of 
data accessibility, but our ability as journals to mandate that by ourselves is rather limited because someone else is going to publish it if we don't. Um, so we are, we, you know, there are antitrust issues with us, um, although we do have a, a, a you know, an international committee of journal of medical journal editors. Um, it, it is hard to set uh, to set those sorts of standards. And anyway, the researchers who are generating those data should participate. Um, it, it's really important to have them participate in, in the in the nuts and bolts of it. But I think the principle is simple. We should be making it available. It would be much. It would enable your work if the FDA required it. Yeah, this is a really good question. One that I ask myself every day. Um, <laughs> Um, so I think um, what Eric said about there being a balance between getting the information out to the public and that being of public use and, and of, of research use versus um, getting getting um, companies to release their data. So we have had we do have a work a workaround, which I'm not saying is, is perfect or ideal, but for example, we published um, a Fitbit study that measured heart rate to predict um, influenza. You like that one, infectious disease. Um, and um, and they had to validate the heart rate data against um, against a gold standard to um, to show that it was um, it was reliable. Um, and obviously, that isn't giving us the data. It isn't allowing scrutiny of the data itself. But there was an, an element of scrutiny there that that allowed us to then go on to to publish it. Obviously, we need to see more more than that as we go, but this was the sort of first step. Okay. Well, that brings us just after the hour. We're now at 4.32. Thank you all so much for your wonderful engagement and questions. Thank our panel for their insights. So now you all are all going to get published tomorrow. <laughs> They're going to get better own. submissions. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. Great. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, everybody, thank you so much. Um, we're going to start moving on. Uh, before we do, I have a couple of announcements to make. Um, but first, we're